Well, shall we begin? It is noon. We're supposed to start. If, if the gentleman in the back would have a seat. <laughs> Mr. Jorgensen? Yes. We're beginning. Oh. Thank you. All right. My name is John Haywood. I am here to talk about the Oasis Legal Citation Technical Committee and our work. Um, that is what we will talk about. I'm at American University Washington College of Law, and I'm the chairman of the courts, basically, subcommittee of this technical committee. Mr. Jorgensen, who is in the back, was the chair or co chair of the entire committee, but he has just fled, so he's not just a member. All right, let's start with what, what is Oasis? Um, Oasis is a standards body, uh, creates international standards of all kinds of things. Some you might have heard of, like open document text, uh, file, file format for um, word processing, uh, legal doc ML, which is coming along quite nicely, uh, which is for legal documents. Um, and now we'll talk about what the committee is doing. We're, we're, we're dealing with citations. We need standards for citation to enable people who have collections of, of documents to link them to web versions or to, to electronic versions of those documents in other repositories and to write resolvers to allow that to happen. To give you an idea of how that works, this is a document case. We'll start, I'm on the case of the court subcommittee, so most of my examples are the courts because it just works better that way. So you have a case with a citation in it. In this case, it's a citation to the Fed Second, U.S. v. Abner in the Fed Circuit. As it works right now, you're reading online, you're reading on an online source, you run across this citation that's not like you have to go to Google Scholar or some other provider of um, online cases. It will give you a URL, you click on the URL, and you get the case. You have to do that all by hand. It's hard for someone who has a, a um, uh, collection of cases to put that information, the metadata that would enable this to happen automatically in a reliable way. It's hard for them to do that. They have to do a lot of um, programming to get it done. Our goal is to make that easier. Uh, one of the major problems with this effort is that, well, what if Google decides they don't want to post cases anymore, or if they move things, or whatever resource you're using moves it, you get the 404 error, and then you know, <coughs> you're kind of post. So the way our standard is supposed to work is you have the same document case with a citation in it. That citation has in metadata encoded in it according to our URI standard. That gets passed to someone who's running a resolver, which is basically a database program, that takes that link information and returns a URL or a series of URLs to give you options that then gives you the case. And it does it automatically. And our job is to write this standard so that resolvers can do their job easily. Is that about right, John? That is absolutely right. Thank you. Okay, so the technical committee um, is involved in a large number of OASIS members. My university joined um, OASIS just for this subcommittee so that um, Amy Taylor and I could work on it. Um, Rutgers is a member, AAAL is a member. Um, there are a lot, of, there are actually several law schools in Georgia State is a member. There are several law schools that are members. Um, our committee is broken up into a bunch of subcommittees. There's the one I'm on, uh, adjudicate, adjudication of courts, court documents, and court tribunal rules. We're in charge of studying the citations for those particular types of legal documents. There are executive branch regulations and administrative documents. There's another one for legislation, constitutions, treaties, and parliamentary documents. The civil law people are very strong on that, that particular subcommittee. There's uh, another subcommittee doing secondary material, treatises, law review articles, things of that nature. This our end. So. And then there's the technical subcommittee, which is actually writing the standard. Um, the technical subcommittee is just now really starting its work. There, there's lots of debates going on on exactly how it's going to work. The other subcommittees are working on, well, I'll tell you what we're kind of just saying. There, the standards that we're using, we're looking at other standards to 
inform our work and we're adapting. And one of them is uh, the U.S. Congress's uh, legislative lookup. Um, you know, legislative lookup and we think the architecture of the uh, um, the House. Uh, at this point, it's, it's just the House, I think. The House of uh, the uh, Lower uh, There's also the Europeans uh, have the European Legislative Identifier. And well, there's a common intel system we're looking at, which is the legal doc. Thanks, so, no. A word of warning, and I have to thank you for this because this was added to my presentation in the middle of yours. Um, proliferation of standards. We do something we have to watch for. Um, we're trying to make this not happen for legal citation. Um, we'll see if it works. Okay, um, because this is a library presentation. We have the obligatory fervor slide, um, the functional requirements of bibliographic records. We are using this as to, to um, structure our work. And, and I'm sure, is anybody here not familiar with fervor? Good. Then I will just scream right through this. Um, we, we know what fervor is. This is the European um, version. This is their, the ELI of uh, the locator, um, their legislative indicator. Uh, you have an idea how they have broken it up. There. Here's a, in the work zone, the work part, it is a, a particular legislative or legal resource. It's a directive, an EU directive. That's the work. They have an identifier for it, which they have, their URI is actually a URL, which if you click on it, you will get to it. Um, they have other things attached into their, their data, which I'm not really going to go into. The expression of that work are all the different official languages. So there's a, a URI for each of those languages. Each of these directives has is set. Uh, this basic URI with stuff tacked onto it. The manifestation are particular formats. Everything on the uh, EU side is available in PDF and HTML. So depending on which one you're linking to, it'll be a slightly different in you know, your language and then your, your manifestation. If you just want the HTML, you'll add these things to the, to the, to the URI. And then of course the item is the actual document that'll be a, the direct link to to a particular PDF or a particular HTML page. Um, if anybody has any questions, please stop me, or if I'm talking too fast. Okay, what our URI will look like? We hope. Um, I'm st I've stole these from Grant. Uh, the, the folks who are doing the, the legal, uh, the legislative one for the, the House because we had them available, and it was easy to do. So I stole some of his uh, his examples. But for example, this is um, in the legislative subcommittee a standard. Um, code reference to the U.S. Code. What would that look like in a scheme, uh, citation scheme, uh, citation identifier scheme? Well, they have it look something like this. There's you know, the beginning, which is tells you what it is, what 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 scheme you're using. It's, yeah, John. You mean um, you mean with the essential um, house markup schema? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what this is. So that's what they're marked. That that tells. The resolver, this is this type of um, markup. The next part is a country code, which tells you what, what country, and it's a standard um, two-letter uh, two uh, country code. Once you're inside the US jurisdiction, it tells you what you're looking at. This is the US code. The next thing is a title and then a section. You just described this in a way that a parser can come through and pull very easily very logically. Another example would be a public law. Um, public law would look more like this. After the U.S., PL, because the resolver would know that PL is, is, is a public law. Um, it's number one, it's 101st Congress, it's the 369th one, and we're talking about section two. Again, for, for a, an automatic parser, it's straightforward. Uh, for older stuff, okay, number, before we had a public law system, uh, it's done by act and then date in a standard day format. Right now, the technical committee is having discussions on what exactly should go into a date field. These are, these are really wonderful conference calls where, where we're talking about, um, you know, well, should there be hyphens or should there not be hyphens? And what order should we put it in? And why do the Americans put the month in the wrong place? Um, so there's things like that. Um, and then, like, here's a, a, a final example of this, uh, statutes of large, which would, again, look like that. It's, it's fairly simple for legislative stuff. For cases, it gets a little more complicated. Um, where, where I 
chunk. Uh, let's see. Where we are right now. The joy of use cases. Um, when I joined the committee, I asked John what we were going to be doing. And he said, use cases. And my response was, <laughs> what's a use case? I had no idea, really. Um, I now know. What it is, is we're looking at the corpus of citations and trying to figure out what the scope is so that the people who are in the technical committee writing the actual standard have something that they can hit against to test. Like, can we describe every citation? Do we have the right variables in the right spot? Do we have the right, are we talking about the right things? Have we, are we covering not just US cases, are we covering you know, civil law countries? Are we covering China, which has a very different system, um, or Japan? You know, what, what exactly are we doing? So we do use cases. The one I'm familiar with is the courts one, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, first thing we did was we sat down and said, well, what are the different kinds of documents we're going to be looking at? What can you cite to that's in our bailiwick? Well, published decisions is a good, a good place to start. Uh, and breaking those down into you know, what type of opinion they are, majority opinion, sole opinion, per curiam, uh, the dissenting opinions, and the concurring opinions. So we, we know that those are out there and we have to deal with them. Published orders in cases. Where the, the court, it's, not a, it's not an opinion, but it's an order in the case. We have to look at those. Other decisions that don't fall into the orders or published decisions range. Um, and other orders, administrative orders, court rules, because that's within our daily way. Um, both types of court rules, both comprehensive ones like the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, and also, you know, the Fifth Circuit's local rules. We have to be able to describe those. Um, trial transcripts, not just, you know, citing them to you know, PACER, PACER type, uh, docket type, member site, sorry, site, but also, you know, in a, in a a legal document you have a site, a site to record. Well, how do you, how exactly are you going to encode that? Um, pleadings, briefs, uh, memorandums of points and authorities, evidence exhibits. Um, that one kind of frightens me. Um, so I don't know exactly how we're going to do it. And then once we 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 did that, once we had our, our scope of what we were going to do, we started to look at the different types of citations. Well. Case decisions and orders. There are decisions that are in print. There are ones that are cited by universal citation. Some states have gone that way. The UK has gone that way. Um, lots of other places have gone to universal citation. Proprietary database citations, Westlaw, Lexis, Bloomberg, because those are a separate set and they, they, they are different. They look different. Uh, and then what we used to call docket number, until a very fun conference call, when we decided that it was going to be called instead the local jurisdiction case identifier, because it's not everybody has dockets. Um, and sometimes you get cases like that. If you've got you know, a case that's unpublished, but it's in PACER, or it's in a, a local um, uh, clerk's office, you need to be able to identify it, so we use that. And then there are rule citations to the rules, and citations to documents and cases briefs, memos, exhibits, records, transcripts, that type of thing. So that also helped limit what we were doing, helped, helped us with our scope. And we decided that the next thing we needed to do was to look at all the different things that make up a citation. What is a citation? What, what are all the things in it? And we have a lot of them. This is a, a, a long slide. Actually, uh, it's two slides. The first thing is the type of, of document. What are we dealing with? Is this a decision? Is it a, um, is it a transcript? Is it an order? What, what exactly are we dealing with? A court identifier. In some cases, that isn't really all that necessary because you'll, you, you'll pull it from, from some other, um, I, either the only thing in your corpus is one particular court, the only things that are reported are a particular court. But other things, other, other examples where you have lots and lots of different courts, you have to have a standard system of court identifier. Um, we figured this will probably be done on a jurisdictional basis. People in each jurisdiction will decide what standard they're going to use to identify the court. But we're just going to define it as a string. We 
don't know what it is, we don't really care what it is, as long as the people who need to use it will understand it, um, especially in non-Roman alphabets. Uh, Frank Bennett, uh, who's on our committee is at, uh, in Nagoya, is doing a lot of work with Chinese and Japanese and other non-Roman alphabets, and that's really difficult to do because they have it's a completely different system. Um, the document author. This isn't always obvious, sometimes this has to be inferred. Uh, if we're dealing with a print citation, the volume is printed in. Uh, the reporter identification. What was the volume? How is it indicated for all the different possible abbreviations? The page. Uh, the local jurisdiction case identifier, the docket number. And this is where it got a little interesting because we, we were trying to decide whether or not we wanted to parse that. Because there's a lot of information packed into a docket number. There's some, I mean, some of the federal, there's the circuit, there's the docket, whether or not it's the criminal docket or the civil docket or the family docket. They append the judge it's assigned to initials sometimes. And something I hadn't realized until, um, I forget, one, one of the people on the, on the call who works in the, the state courts um, said, well, you know, we have, we, we, assign, we assign judges initials. And if the case gets changed to a different judge, Sometimes the initials change, and sometimes they don't. <laughs> That's when we decided that a docket number or a case, a local jurisdiction case identifier was a string, and we didn't care what's in that string. Let somebody else deal with that. We need to capture the information, but the resolver doesn't need to know it. And that's key. Uh, the name, party names, usually it's the parties. You don't know, it might not be. It might be 20 bales of cotton. Or, you know, the schooner Charming Betsy might be the name of the case. Uh, the decision date, the date the decision actually came down, and the publication date, which are not the same thing. Um, and we decided that would just be in here. Parenthetical information, and this is the one that's just going to, I think, drive us crazy. Because there's a lot, think about a U.S. case citation. There's a lot of information packed into the parenthetical. Who wrote it? What its weight is? Um, uh, some examples of that a little bit later. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, the country, which is very important, this is an international standard. The jurisdiction inside the country. Are we federal? Are we state? Are we provincial? Is it um, you know, a, a particular type of court, an administrative court, um, uh, a, a, an adjudicative court, whatever, whatever it is? The venue, the posture, which confused us after we wrote this a while back and I couldn't remember what, what we meant by it. John and I came to the conclusion that we met stage of case. You know, and sometimes that's different. That changes. You know, you're looking at an interim order as opposed to a final order. And you want to be able to, to capture that. It may be important. Further court identifiers, you might need to be able to, it, it might be a particular panel of a court that you want to be able to capture. So we need to, we need to have that in there. The accession number, if you're using universal citation, that's a serial number that's assigned to the case. The paragraph number, because that's how you cite in a universal citation. Or if you're in print citation, the pinpoint cite, uh, pinpoint print cite. These are all the things. And if anybody who's watching this at home or here can think of other things that we missed, we would love to hear from you. Um, this, is, this is what we, we think we captured it all, but you never know. A few important points before we go any further. Um, as a committee, we are describing, not prescribing. We have to look at what's actually out in the wild and describe that thoroughly and capture what we need to capture. The hardest part of our job is remembering what is not our job. There are times when people start going into things that are trying to specify things in the standard that really aren't the standard's job. The standard is not the resolver. <laughs> the resol we don't care what the resolvers do. We want the resolvers to have, have something to work with, but we don't, we don't need to know what they're doing. We need to know, we, we need to focus on what we're doing, just describing what actually exists. Historical citation forms are important. Um, you can't just use, uh, the example I like to use is uh, uh, things that are in the uh, US, uh, US reports, the early stuff, where they're citing to the nominatives. You need to be able to capture that information, even though now, of course, you go to like two US but to find it. In the, in the case when somebody's pulling that up to code it, it's not going to say if it's a case from you know, 
1804, it's not going to say two U.S. or one U.S. It's going to say three cranch or four wheat or whatever. You need to be able to capture that information. Wait. Yeah. On that information, are uh -huh. you talking about use cases where people are capturing that relationship of nominative to the more modern one? Yeah. Okay. That's a bigger burden than just capturing the nominative. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And the distinctions between print and publish. Um, we're, we're talking not necessarily, we don't really care if it was publish. We're, when we talk about print, we're talking about something that's available in print, whether or not it's officially published or not. So something that's published in the federal appendix is not, is not published, but it's published. And we need to be able to describe that. So that's another, we, we, we had to make that very clear in our new case. Uh, here's some examples. Um, this is a post-1874 Supreme Court opinion. This is what they look like when you break them down. You've got a case name string, a comma, a volume number, a reporter abbreviation, and the first page number and the year of decision. Those are required. All, all citations should have those. Everything in green is you know, maybe, um, pinpoint page numbers. Circuit justice, if it's, uh, you know, one of the justices acting as in his or her uh, uh, role as the justice for a particular circuit is showing an opinion. Uh, parenthetical information, the judge, the type of document, the weight, some examples. Regents v. University of California v. Bakke. Regents of the University of California v. Bakke. It's a standard decision. Fits all the basics, just the black stuff um, shows up there. This is a little bit more data. You need to be, we want to be able to capture that. Here we've got it's Blackman's opinion, and it's concurring in part and dissenting in part. What's the weight of this particular document? <laughs> I mean, it, it gets funky, and we, I wanted to be able to make sure we could capture that. Um, we still have to, once we get done with the use cases, we then start looking at the logic for how we're going to put this into the standard, and that's where this is going to be really interesting, because I don't know how we're <laughs> well, I mean, there, there's things to debate about that, too, yeah. which we can get to. We'll get to that. Um, procuring opinions um, is a particular thing. Uh, and here, well, here's an example of a circuit judge. Uh, this is on the, uh, the NBA draft, uh, where I was legal. Uh, and, you know, wrong, name, wrong spelling of my name, but we'll make we'll, we'll, we'll sure. that uh, okay, pre-1875 status opinions. Bit different. We've got official reporter volumes, official reporter abbreviation, nominative, nominative. Again, the, the idea we're, we're trying to capture that, that the information there. Examples, um, Charming Betsy, uh, USC Palmer. And here's you know, examples of the, uh, the nominatives and how they look. Uh, Court of Appeals cases, uh, post-1880, uh, this is kind of a unique time period because there are both, in that period, there are both circuit courts and courts of appeals. Both existed at the same time, and you have to be real careful as to which one you're citing to. Uh, and it's you know, just different captures, uh, different things captured. Standard one, um, this is a circuit court, um, and they usually include some sort of thing on the end. Uh, here's a circuit judge. Circuit judges don't always publish in the U.S. reports, sometimes they publish in federal reports. So we want to be able to make sure we, the, the use case encompasses that so that the folks writing the actual standard will know how to do it. Uh, universal citation, a little bit different. Uh, serial document, document numbers, but it has a lot of the other, some of the same things that the other cases do. Uh, these are all hypothetical because the federal government does not use, the federal courts do not use universal citation, but we can hope uh, that's what they will look like. They're actually a lot easier to put into it parsable scheme. So we like them. We like them a lot. Um, and this is based on this is based on WLL's uh, citation guide, universal citation guide. Um, so hopefully if when if and when the federal courts do this, they will they will use this system. Uh, and of course proprietary databases. Uh, a little bit different. Local jurisdiction. It, it has you're starting to see the same the same case um, data types showing up over and over again, which is really, I think, useful for the, uh, the folks who are writing the, the, uh, the standard. Uh, just different types of, of decisions. Uh, 
different stuff is after. I mean, it's, it's a different number, but um, they follow a fairly standard pattern. Okay. Docket numbers. Uh, examples. Um, that's a slip off. Uh, coding this. This could be kind of hard to parse, but this will be my key here. Uh, just examples. It was late last night. I put a lot of examples. Okay. In conclusion, that up while we're talking, um, because John informed me that I had to have a cap in my presentation. Uh, this is pretty much where we're at right now. We're we're at the use case. Uh, the the court's use case is, I'd say, 70% done. We still have to do rules. We still have to do case documents and cases, and we have to expand it beyond U.S. I mean, I, I'm a U.S. lawyer. I know the U.S. system. That's what I've described. Um, Frank in, in Japan is going to be doing you know, the Japanese and Chinese uh, to get an example of some non-Roman uh, alphabets. Um, I'm hoping to pull some people from the civil law side uh, to look at you know, maybe German or, or French to make sure that their cases, and um, when they do cite them, are in, in a normal way or at a way that, that fits um, our use case. Our use case fits them. Um, we're also looking at, like I'm going to do international court cases to make sure that those citations work. Nuremberg cases will work, things like that. Making sure we have everything. And that's where, right now, we're, we're completing the use cases. Um, we're forwarding them to the technical committee, and the technical committee is going to start arguing about which standard is better, which, part, which standard is better. And it will be fun and exciting. I, anybody who wants to join Oasis and join join our happy crew is more than welcome. Um, if you don't want to join Oasis and you still want to help, we can, we can work around that, right, John? Okay. Well, Oasis is fairly open, and uh, in order to get voting rights, you have to go through the joining rigmarole and all that. But if you want, and in order to get access to some of the material, right. you have to be a member. But to be an observer, you just sign up. Sign up. And so, and if happen. you're an observer, you can use the the public list servers, and uh, everybody that's involved in the committee sees all the public list server stuff as well as the private stuff. So, if you have something to say, it'll get heard. Yeah. And it's a, it's a it's a fun project. I mean, we're having a good time. The the con I think the hardest part of the committee work has been scheduling conference calls. Yeah. Because we have people in Nagoya, L.A., Phoenix, Georgia, Ithaca, D.C., uh, Newark, and London. And Bologna. And Bologna. Oh God, I can't forget Bologna. So we have to have multiple. Um, multiple uh, conference calls. There's a East Coast, there's a Pacific Rim, and there's an Atlantic Rim, and Brussels. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. That, that, that's the part of, of working on an international standards body that has been the most interesting for me, has been sure. just trying to coordinate everything. Um, it's, it's, and, and learning how to, how to use universal time <laughs> when setting up, when setting up. Because, because if you schedule a conference call and you get daylight savings screwed up in either Japan or here, and Frank, Bennett who gets up at four in the morning to attend these conference calls, and he's missed it by an hour. It's not. I. I, I he has complaints. He has complaints. <laughs> <laughs> Legitimate complaints. Uh -huh. So that's that. Any questions about the, the process or what we're doing? Yeah, this might be one of those like don't throw tomatoes at me for asking the question. <laughs> no, don't worry. Don't worry. To what degree, not for the rules, but to what degree does the Blue Book or any other sort of citation system help you or or not at all with sort of def defining some of those pieces of citation? It's actually really helpful. Okay. Um, it was for me. When I was going through here, you want to find out what's in a court case. Right? You, know, you look at the standard citator because uh, hopefully they, you know, we looked at that, we looked at um, Allwood, and then I started going through just because I'm sick that way, going through the federal cases and just pulling random federal cases um, from you know, the pre-federal the pre, uh, the pre reporter era to see how they were citing stuff. Hmm? Right. 
May I comment? Sure. Of course. <laughs> yeah, um, things like the Blue Book, because what you're really trying to do is write a, you're trying to abstract and come up with I, unique identifiers. For, I mean, we were talking about Ferber before. And at the level of fervor that we're dealing with here and creating the standard, we're talking about the work. And it's the parsers that people are, the resolvers, people are going to write based upon our standard that will give you an instance of that work, right? So we're concerned with the work. And or perhaps a manifestation of the work. Yeah, and that, um, what constitutes enough data to uniquely identify that thing. And so if you're looking through the blue book, as far as our job is concerned, you get massive amounts of detail we don't need, right. but when you look at the blue book, it describes, okay, a reporter decision. Here is all of the parts of a reporter decision that you may or may not generally think of that will result in a unique identifier for a document. And that's not, of course, the volume number, abbreviation, and page number. It's more than that. And so what more, what are those more things that are available? And those are defined in the blue book. But you answered sort of a follow-up question, which I have, which is uh, that you're writing, you're really writing for that open URL right. parser. So you're writing for what you said, sort of the minimal amount of description that you need, not for ultimately outputting citations or and for people who have repositories of documents. Sure. And you know, I, I can see that. this being done That's automatically, right. running a parser through case law, pulling up cases. And if our use cases are done properly, so whoever's writing that parser, it, it gives them an idea of what they're looking for to find to encode it in our standard and you know print it out. And it's gonna have to obviously be checked, but I could see that that working fairly well, on, on a, as long as the you know the, the text of the corpus is fairly clean. Yeah. So, like the debates we have when we're talking about use cases, is number one, given the kind of citation you've got, and that's where things branches out, branch out. Sometimes you have a docket number, a slip up citation of one kind or another. Sometimes you have a print reporter citation of one kind or another. Sometimes you have a universal, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Within each one of those categories, what's the minimum amount of information to uniquely identify a document at least 98% of the time? And uh, so then we have to identify all the data items that are available. So we got to talk about what's actually available in a print citation that will do that. And and then we have to have a debate about what's necessary to identify the document uniquely as opposed to what is then mere description. And those two bleed into each other because you have to have more than just the minimum for that unique identification. And at some point, you're actually getting into description. Mm -hmm. And that's too much. And, but the citation. and it becomes unmanageable when it becomes too much. And we have to control what we're doing. We have sure. to remember that's not our job. But the citation practices in some places, like I know German, right. I'm not sure German cases is a good example, but some, some like German scholarly pieces aren't identified with full, kind of full identification. I don't know whether that's true of court documents in other countries, but the, the practice is to cite with less than the amount of information that you would actually need to find it. So do you have to add description for those? Sometimes, and it becomes a, I'm more than happy to have you talk, John. It becomes, well, that's what really becomes interesting about this. With certain kinds of citation, quite frankly, you have explicit and implied information. So like when you see 354 ILL 15, okay, that is a very cryptic thing, but it tells you quite a lot. It does. It tells you that it's a US case from the state of Illinois and it's the Illinois Supreme Court. And those are all individual data items that are needed to uniquely describe it. So you've got that kind of thing going on quite a lot, actually. There's a lot of implicit data. And then, 
you've got the idea, and then you've also, for many things, like that's a good example, quite frankly, you've got some situations where you don't, just don't have enough. And what do you do in that? I mean, practically what we do at that point is spec out what will be enough. And then to the extent that the information is available or not available, it's up to the, the resource originator to either fill in when they're creating their URIs to embed in their source documents, or you have to write a resolver that can handle the, the ambiguity and say, you know, given this amount of information, it could be this, 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 or this. And that, quite frankly, is something that somebody who's going to write a commercial resolver is, that's the job. Mm -hmm. So, but we need to do that as best we can to make it as clear as possible. So like for cases, it's actually kind of interesting because if you look at court case publication in one form or another all over the world, quite frankly, there are really three kinds of citation and only three. There are seven. <laughs> Committed. You've got some kind of published reporter of some kind or other, you've got some kind of slip opinion, however you want it, you know, you don't might not want to use a court generated document straight from the court. And that's going to be oriented around something that is, to an American will be a docket number of one kind or another, or you've got a universal citation. You know, and quite frankly, the Lexis and Westlaw decisions are a lot like a court reporter yeah. citation because it's a published thing. It's a variation on the theme. So, but that's, that's the kinds of decisions we're making when we're thinking about and talking about this and writing up our use case documents. So the technical committee is getting a document from us saying, okay, when you're talking about court decisions, there are these three categories of documents that need to be handled. And for each one of these three categories of documents, here is the minimum necessary information, and here are the variables. So sometimes you'll get this and not this, and so we have to have a space where you can put in this or this, and, and also eventually get a unique strength. And also, where is this likely to fail? Where is the citation going to fail? Because you, if you're writing the parser, you want to be able to, to, to figure out what, 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 what's not going to work. Where, where does the citation break down? Where are you not going to have information? And that's, that's our value add. <laughs> and that's all I've got. Uh, anybody have any questions? No? Okay. Couple. So I'll just start with the easy housekeeping process question. Um, in the context of always, is how, how do you guys manage timelines over specific milestones that you're supposed to define, and what do you envision the rollout period to be? How much betting that ultimately leads to adoption? There, there's a there is a process with Oasis okay. um, that I'm not 100 percent familiar with because I'm fairly new to it. Can take, we decide the uh, individual technical committees decide on their own deadlines um, and just some of the criticisms that Oasis get <laughs> because there are committees who just, you know, get to a certain stage and they just wobble in that stage forever, which is what we're not going to do. But we're a lot of busy people. Right, uh, right. Yeah. So what's going to happen with this is we've got some of the key <coughs> use case documents for like courts and for legislation mm -hmm. in, a, in a presentable, maybe not complete, but presentable shape. So at this point, they're getting, as we speak, they're getting presented to the, the committee as a whole. And they're, and at this point, they're going to be ripped apart into a size and rewritten and made better. And so we can see that kind of process taking, you know, given everybody's work schedules and everything, six months, maybe a little bit longer. And at that point, it's up to the, tech, uh, the technical subcommittee mm -hmm. to really take that information. And they've already actually made a lot of decisions on their general approaches. 
they just need the specific information for each document type to figure out how they're going to plug it in, you know, in, in ways that, that fit with the approaches that they already decided on and integrated. So that's going to take a little while still. Sure. It will. And then once the standard is developed, it's then put up to a vote. Yeah. Uh, all the OASIS members. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting the way the technical committee seems to be working its way out. And it kind of, I was thinking about it when I was looking at the, the cartoon. Uh -huh. You know, there are all these standards out there, and what we're doing really is adding yet another standard. However, the interesting thing about it, and the encouraging thing, I think, about it, is, is that the people who have created a lot of these major pre-existing standards are on the technical subcommittee, yeah. and they're working together. And uh, so, like the stuff that you were showing from Grant Bergatini, who's, who's a major participant major in this, he created something that's extraordinarily useful for the Congress, the Congress. US government, for their purposes. Their purposes being writing, drafting, publishing, Legislating and writing draft. Right. Every, the, whole, the whole workflow of the Congress. So that approach is something that's actually, number one, it's very similar to what other people have done. When you look at what they've done, like ELI for the European Union and the Como and Toso, the approach is very similar, except that with each one of these systems, they have some inherent limitations based upon the material that was being worked with and who they were working for at the time. And so now we've got everybody working together to make a completely generalizable system. And uh, to the extent that we're able to force them to do so, we're making compromises and adjustments, and we're doing something a little bit different than all of those systems in order to make a generalizable markup standard. I don't see any of these existing systems going away because they're kind of optimized for their for their uh, jurisdictions and communities. We're going to have something else that can be used by everyone everywhere, including publishers. You know, that's the goal. The for-profit legal publishers. They're on the committee. People, some people. Yeah, I mean these resolvers. You can have any kind of document and. West can write a resolver that makes use of these strings to get you the West document. Absolutely no problem with that. And this is a completely open standard. And they'll you know, hopefully they'll do it. Yeah. But that's my next question. When do you envision it well will, it, will there be a time that it would be in the interest of promoting the standard and finalizing it actively to solicit the opinion of the people who will make the resolvers. I mean, oh, this seems absolutely. to be an overarching content. Have, have any of them weighed in yet to I give a hint so. of how they might adopt or not adopt? Uh, some. I think LII is going to work on that. Yeah. They're on the committee, so. That's something we can talk about later if you want to be sure. um, But yes. <laughs> I mean, we, we, want to, we want to hear from the people who are yeah. writing the resolvers. Yeah. There are, there are target. Right. Our target audience. Right. It's, it's going to be fun. Good. This will make our lives all easier. Right, Jim? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. And, you know, I think we have what? Stats. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>